Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens. Ask me almost anything. My name is Glenn Gers, and I come to you every Monday through Friday, if I can make it, at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is currently, by the way, on Daylight Savings Time, for those of you who are coming an hour late. Uh, most of the time, I am here Monday through Friday giving you step-by-step -step lessons in how to write a script by letting you look over my shoulder, watch me as I write, talk about what I'm doing. But every once in a while, the questions pile up, and I feel like it's a good idea to just do an Ask Me Anything hour. That's what we're doing right now. Today's first question is going to be, how much detail do you put in a character description. Um, and this is actually from Marit Latoso, one of our regular uh, watchers. And he said, uh, how much do you recommend describing some physical characteristics that are not essential just because that's how I see it in my head, knowing that something internal is the important focus, and of course, that's the stuff I have to establish well. Um, so, <laughs> I want to talk about this. The first thing I'm going to do is um, uh, what, we're, what I'm going to do is show you a half dozen or more um, descriptions that I just yanked out of uh, famous scripts by famous writers, give you a sense of how it works. Um, however, before that, I just wanted to talk about this question because something uh, that uh, shows up a lot in these questions, yes, it's trash truck day. There we go. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have you. Um, uh, let me just uh, talk about this for a second. Uh, questions. The thing about almost everybody's question is, in the question, you kind of have the answer. <laughs> and uh, hello, Javier. Hello, Natasha. Hello, Butte. Hello, Rachel. Everybody's piling in. I'm so glad. We are doing an Ask Me Anything, in case you guys didn't see that on the credits. Uh, the credit, the question, the basic question we're starting with, how much detail do you put in a character description? But what I was talking about, because this question is from you, Marit Latoso. That is right. We're doing your question from the other day. You asked, how much do you recommend uh, some physical characteristics that are not essential? Um, knowing that there's something internal is what's important. And what I love about this question is, is it kind of answers itself. And and really, uh, hello, Larry. Uh, really, what I think that, that I want to try and get into everyone's head is mostly you already know the answer. Um, I, I want to try and prepare you for the fact that I cannot always be with you. I will not be here forever. And when I am not, I want you to have the tools to work without me. So I am going to uh, to just point out Almost always, when you ask the question, if you are brave, you can find the answer in there. Usually it's an answer you don't want to hear, but it will be in there. Um, yes, thank you, Dialectics. I am going to, to definitely get on that. Hang, a, hang on a second. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, actually, if you watch Fractured, you may not have watched the right movies. Fracture with Anthony Hopkins and Ryan Gosling. Um, there is a movie called Fractured um, with Sam Worthington, which is also really fun. Um, but <laughs> damn you, trash truck. Yes, I knew, dialectics, no problem. Um, hello, Pedro. So let's get to this right away because we got a lot of good questions here. Um, this is from the movie Stillwater, the script Stillwater. Um, and uh, he's, he's just a good writer. Um, Tom, <laughs> now I can't remember his name. Uh, Tom. <laughs> anyway, the point is, let's look at this. Um, it's it's here uh, about the middle of the, the par second paragraph. It says, among them, his face covered with a paper mask is Bill Baker, 50, a tired, lean, strong man absorbed by his task. He stands in what must have been a kitchen. His gloved hands lift the rubble. Shing! He throws it into the dumpster. Psh! Bill digs up a plastic, etc., etc. Now, here's the the, the deal. Um, if you notice, yes, it says tired, lean, strong. That's not really a physical description, not, not much of a physical description. That could be a lot of different guys. And what's more, uh, <laughs> honestly, Matt Damon isn't that lean in the movie. Um, so, okay, 
Cool. <laughs> I am wonderful as always. Yep, good. Okay, let's keep going with this. So uh, the point here is there was actually very little physical description. Likewise, uh, Sorry to Bother You by Boots Riley. Uh, the beginning of the script says, a young man, Kesha Green, is being interviewed for a job at a telemarketing firm. The interviewer looks over a lengthy resume. In his lap, Cassius proudly holds a large plaque with the words, Employee of the Month, Cassius Green, engraved on it. Okay, if you notice, there's no description of Cassius whatsoever. Um, we don't even know how old he is. We don't know what he looks like. It doesn't matter because the character, first of all, I think they had already cast it uh, when he wrote it or, or certainly wrote it with, with the actor in mind. But the point is it, that, that the description is about who the person is, not what they look like, not, uh, not th what type they are, something very specific about usually what they are doing. Now let's look at this. Star Wars, the original. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is an actual script. It's hard, hard to know, but I, uh, I, I believe that this is the actual script. Um, a lone figure, Luke Skywalker, a farm, a farm boy with heroic aspirations who looks much younger than his 18 years. His shaggy hair and baggy tunic give him the air of a simple but lovable lad with a prize-winning smile. Now, um, yes, shaggy hair, but partly I think that they're, they're saying he's a bumpkin. Um, a prize-winning smile, you know, kind of. <laughs> the main thing is that we're supposed to find him likable, handsome, young, uh, and at the time, shaggy hair was stylish. Um, but, but the point is, there wasn't a lot of description. No hair color, no height, no weight. It, it didn't matter. The matter. What mattered is that he is a farm boy with heroic aspirations who looks younger than his years. He's young, he's inexperienced, he's naive. Another one, Ratatouille, okay? Uh, now this is describing a lot of, of very specific camera work because it's a Pixar film and they planned out, they, they actually kind of draw their movies while they're scripting them. So it says the uh, action freezes as the window explodes. Uh, underneath uh, the splayed pages, shielding himself from the shards of splintering glass is inexplicably a rat, Remy. He's scrawny, frightened, almost comic. It's hard not to feel sympathetic towards the little guy. Okay, so once again, not describing what he looks like as a rat, talking about his personality as, as like he's scrawny because that suggests that he is not f frightening or, or bulky or, or intimidating. Um, the idea is that, that we are describing their, their personality in their physical sense. We are describing the... Uh, the essence of the thing that will be played by the actor, not something physical about them. Um, and, and let's just do some more. Uh, uh, the Hudsucker Proxy from uh, some very writerly writers. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to pick very different writing styles so that you can see what I'm talking about. Um, a young man is crawling out of the window on the ledge. By the way, if you haven't seen this movie, it's amazing. Uh, it's underrated. Uh, with the opening uh, of the window, Auld Lang Syne fl filters out. This one's Norval Barnes. That's somebody talking. Uh, the man gingerly straightens on his leg. He is perhaps in his late 20s. He wears a conical New Year's Eve cap and a leather apron with information printed on the leather apron. Once again, we are actually getting a lot of physical uh, stuff about him. We wouldn't see what he's wearing. We knew that it's New Year's Eve. We know that he's got this weird mailroom uh, apron, which actually will come uh, become important to his development as a character. And he looks with nervous determination into the void. Um, what we know about him now is where he is emotionally, nervous determination into the void. He is planning to jump out the window or jump off the ledge. Um, and and what we what we know about him is that he is young. He is uh, emotionally distraught. He's on a window ledge, um, but we don't we don't know that he looks like Tim Robbins. <laughs> I'm not sure that he did look like Tim Robbins. Um, yes, writerly writers, the Cohen brothers. They tend to be very literature based. They love writing the the the, the kind of writing you read, not just the kind of writing that goes into movies. So I was talking about the Cohen brothers. Um, Cool. 
Cool, Pedro. That's great. Ratatouille. These uh, Pixar scripts are pretty amazing, but do remember they're not written in a normal fashion. They kind of write and direct at the same time. Um, but let's talk about Joker, okay? Arthur, 30s, tears in his eyes from laughing so hard. He's trying to get it under control. His greasy black hair hanging down over his forehead. He's wearing an old faded green cardigan sweater, a threadbare gray scarf, thin from years of use, hangs loosely around his neck. So if you notice, there's actual physical specific description. It's just not of him. Um, yeah, he has long greasy black hair, but that's... Um, partly because he's an iconic character who had, tends to have long hair. Um, and then uh, he says, down at the bottom, it says, despite the laughter, there's real pain in his eyes, something broken in him. Looks like he hasn't slept in days. Um, so once again, even when describing his physical, like he hasn't slept in days, we're not saying he has bags under his eyes. Or, we're talking about the condition of the character, the emotional situation of the character, the situation of the character. That's how you introduce a character. You don't worry about them physically unless it's really important to the story. Um, in this case, his green sweater is relevant because it's part of his iconic character that is, is DC Comics based. However, uh, it's, it's really important to recognize how much of the physical description is not the physical body. It's the presentation of the person in what they choose to wear or have been forced by their lives to wear, uh, things like that. Um, let's look at Michael Clayton uh, discussing uh, one of the main characters, not Michael. Karen Crowder is sitting fully dressed on the john. She is senior in-house counsel for the largest agricultural chemical supply manufacturer on the planet. She is hiding here. Okay, now look at just what we've done already. She's fully dressed, sitting on the john. Okay, something is wrong. <laughs> um, she is, and then given this extraordinarily important uh, lawyer's position, and then she is hiding here. She is trying to fight off a panic attack using a breathing exercise she read about in an airline magazine. Okay, we are learning an awful lot about this character without any physical description. We don't know what she's wearing. We just know that she is, she's a lawyer and she's fully dressed. She's probably in business clothes. But what we do know is that she reads in airline magazines and gets self-help tips from them. These are the sort of things that we, uh, he, the author is trying to uh, describe the life of the person through physical and situational details. That's how you do it. Um, hang on a second. David Mamet, um, uh, and I am once again pretty sure this is the actual script. Um, at the end of the bar, Larry, the ugly American. Earlier in the script, they talk about an ugly American's voice. He's got an obvious attitude, all of it bad. But there's something about the guy. He's not all bluster, and he has the look of a seasoned tough guy who knows how to get rough and tumble. He's big, and yeah, he's got a gut, but the rest of him looks solid. OK, so, yes, there's some physical description there because we're trying to he's trying to suggest uh, an, an older American male <laughs> um, and not a super action here, not an action figure. He's, he's an old guy with a gut, but he's extremely tough. There's a certain amount of swagger in the language of the description. Very often, uh, just like in Star Wars, a prize winning smile, there's attitude of the character or about the character in the words, even if they are not describing the, the way the character says things. Um, okay. Hi, Mr. Fiction. I see you. Uh, I will get to you in a second. Aries Aurelian. Hi. Hello, R. Fung. Um, okay. Uh, Mr. Fiction, I will get to you. I apologize, but I got, I got a long list of things to get to first. Um, and then finally, I wanted you to see this one because it's in many ways wrong, <laughs> but really good. Um, and and a, the point is you can compare this to something like Sorry to Bother You or, or Stillwater or, or Joker. Any of them are very, very spare and they are very, very much in the moment. Then you get something like this, Michael Mann <laughs> describing a character in the movie Heat. Uh, it's, it's Val Kilmer's character, Chris. Um, Chris Shahirless crosses past stacks of gavel. So this is a guy who's pre-directing the movie in his mind because he knows he's going to direct it. But then wears hard hat over a, Mon a Mongol cut Levi's black boots and a sleeveless sweatshirt. 
Uh, okay, very, very specific, brand name in a way, um, carries over his shoulder a company, a tool case. He looks like a construction worker by day who by night hits L.A. slams, jams, and raves. He's 29 from Austin, Texas. Chris is also a Highline pro, a box man who knows five ways to open any safe made. And there's, he's a, a safe cracker, a thief. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the, the characters that are being described here, now we're talking about, um, then it says, he and Macaulay were cellmates in San Quentin Penitentiary from 1984 to 1987. Chris hit the streets in 1988. He's a hot dog and spends money as fast as he can make it. Uh, right now, and he, uh, he and the clerk exit to the sales counter. Now, that is a whole lot of backstory. You obviously can't see what he's doing is telling us who the actor is playing, what the actor knows about himself, and what we will later, le later learn some of as we go on. But the main thing is he's giving information to the reader and to the uh, production that will not be on the screen. And that's okay. You can do many, many things. Uh, the problem with, with the thing about heat is uh, you can bog down a little, but it's not terrible. Honestly, there's some good writing in there. Um, so what I'm saying is, look at all the different possibilities, but do notice how rarely, how <laughs> how much you have to have ruled the world for 20 years, like, like Michael Mann did when he made Heat, that you can get away with that kind of huge hunk of, of literary description. Mostly it's woven in to the introductory moment. That's how you introduce a character and how much you describe. That's what gets the character um, engaged in the audience's mind instead of presented. Um, that's the most important thing. You are trying to hook the people into the character's situation, into their personality and what's going to happen, not into what they look like. Okay. Uh, okay, hang on, Arfang. I'm going to, uh, because I tend to lose my way um, <laughs> with a lot of these things, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on, um, uh, a lot of these questions. Um, yes, the answer is screenplay for animation is different from that of feature film. I suggest you research this by um, uh, going online, looking for podcasts and interviews with animation writers. Um, they will describe the process. It's very, very, very different. However, a lot of them love to talk and they love to tell their stuff. There's a lot of Pixar stuff. There's whole books about how Pixar works, but um, but there's also interviews. If you can get podcast interviews or magazine interviews with people who have written scripts for animation, and they always do them when the movie comes out, they have the writer talk to the press, uh, especially at awards season, you will find a great deal of information about the specific details of how you write for animation. Um, okay. Uh, yes, that's absolutely true. Coen Brothers wrote uh, Hudsucker Proxy with Sam Raimi. Raimi? <laughs> uh, we do not want to take a diss Raimi's credit on that. It's uh, it's definitely, they were all like a team back then. They also worked, at, I think Raimi actually worked on Blood Simple. Um, hello, Aaron. Okay, so we have moved past this. We've got that done. The important thing I want to talk to you again is mostly you already know the answer. Um, uh, Martelosa's question said, knowing that there's something internal is the important focus and where I have to establish well. So yeah, you knew it. And, I, and I'm and i glad to answer these questions. But like I said, I won't always be here for you. So when I'm not, I want you to remember to think about what you already know, because you know more than you think. Um, likewise, let's talk about a question from Elizabeth from a while back. Can you talk about realistic options for older writers. Um, hang on a second. I'm just going to answer Andrew's question. Do you think the difference is partially because Heat was based on a series of true anecdotes? No, not at all. I think it's because Heat was written by a guy who knew he was going to direct, who had gotten away with, he had done Miami Vice, he had done huge hit movies. He could do what he wanted, and he liked to be this kind of, like he has since written a novel sequel to Heat. In other words, he wrote the sequel to Heat as a novel, not as a movie. <laughs> um, partly probably because the production of the sequel to Heat would have been impossible. But the point is, Michael Mann wanted to write a novel 
type screenplay when he wrote Heat, and he could get away with it because he he was going to make that movie. There was there was no question when he was writing that script. There was no question he was going to not get to make that movie. So he could write it the way he wanted. But I don't think it's because it was based on true anecdotes. I do believe that the in a lot of the detail was based in true anecdotes. He was he had glommed up a lot of research. Um, okay, but let's get back to Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth's original question was this. Okay, Elizabeth said, can you talk about the realistic options for older writers? Uh, this was after I had mentioned that I am basically at this point retired, partly aged out. Um, she said, you're a pro and you said you were effectively retired, which is a travesty. I don't know. I, I can't complain. I had a good run and, and things do change. The world changed and uh, there's a lot of things going on there. But anyway, um, it made me wonder, what the heck am I, was, am I doing? Should I only do pilots and hope someone buys them, feature-length films, or should I write plays? I just want to see my work get made, e.g. community theater would qualify as a win for me. Thanks. Um, I'm going to take a second here to say hi to some people. Hi, Maria. Welcome back. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> no, that does not count as old. That counts as just fine. You're okay. Um, that's okay. The yoga ball's nice too. We don't, we don't want to worry about that. Um, but thank you, Larry. Uh, okay. So here's the point in Elizabeth's question. The answer is kind of there. Um, I just want to see my work get made. Community theater would qualify as a win for me. Um, here's the thing I want to talk about because, uh, this is, this is, uh, really important. You can do art. All right. Seriously, you are allowed. You are capable. You can do art. Can you do art professionally? Probably not. Okay. That's a very, very small slice, slice of people doing art. Um, there is absolutely no reason to say you can't do art. You're not allowed. Oh, I'm going to change my autofocus. <laughs> um, you can do art. What you cannot necessarily do is, is win the Super Bowl of art. But that's okay, because not everyone who plays the game has to get the gold medal. Um, so what I really want to talk to you about is, uh, the, you asked, Elizabeth asked for realistic options, so I am going to talk about that. But the first thing I want to say is, think honestly about why you're doing the art, okay? Um, because there's a bunch of reasons that people do it. And you need to honestly think about it because so many people, I've known people who are like, especially coming, I grew up in New York. I knew a lot of people in New York. As far as they were concerned, if they couldn't be published in the New Yorker, it didn't count. That's crazy. Okay. Uh, that suggests that recognition is more important than doing the art. <laughs> and, and the basic question is like, if you could only play tennis against your local people at your tennis club, would you not play? You should. You should play as much and as well as you can. Um, but think about what, what you're looking for out of art. If you're looking for fame, recognition, and by fame, I don't mean, you know, cover of magazines. Some people are like, oh, I want to get into this prestigious publication, or I want to be picked up by a studio, or blah, blah, blah. That's not realistic, okay? Realistically, that only happens to a very small people of the people of the people who devote their entire lives to it, okay? Of the people who work all out, study hard, and work for a long time in order to get that. Sometimes people break in and they're young, um, and that is lovely. It's a great story, but the truth is that most of success is luck. In other words, the right person has the ability to put you into the game at the moment that they run into you. And what brings them into you and what makes you attractive to them is mainly chance, okay? A matter of chance. So um, while it can be that if somebody starts writing scripts, as, as Andrew says, the guy who wrote Highlander was in college when he wrote and sold his script. Yes, let's remember, Highlander was, like what, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? Do you know how many people were writing scripts then? Not that many. Um, do you, I don't also know exactly how he got that script to people, but I guarantee you he very it's very unlikely that he simply walked up to the front gate of whatever studio and said, here, I've got a script. 
Um, very often you need to know someone or have some form of access, which has become much, much harder since I started out, since Highlander guys started out. Um, okay, so let's just talk about the reality of doing art, which is if you are not doing it because you love doing it, you should really consider why, what you think you're going to get from it realistically, you're not going to. I mean, the odds are unlikely that someone older is going to get it. If you are 18, 21, and you decide you want to get recognition as a screenwriter and you're willing to put in 10 years, in that 10 years, you may make it. You may not. Most people don't. That's just a fact. It has nothing to do with you. I don't know you. I don't know if you're good or bad or what situation you are have as far as access. So I'm not saying anything personal to you. I'm saying statistically, most people do not make a living off of art by way most. Okay. So the question is, what are you doing it for? And if you are doing it because you like doing it or because you want to see if you can do it, those are the reasons that people play tennis, because it feels good, because they want to see how well they can do today. That's why you do art, okay? So um, I, I am going to say to you uh, that the other thing an older writer, because by the way, when we're talking about older, no, we're not talking about 28. We're not talking, we're talking about 40, 50, 60, okay? Older. Um, and, and an older writer has to consider the fact that it takes a long time to get good at the art of script writing. It's a specific art, and it will take you years, five years or more, to get good at script writing. You may be a natural. You may have absorbed enough movies and have enough going, as many people are and do, to your first draft will be actually in pretty good shape. But even then, you'd be surprised what you don't know. There's a great moment in uh, the show Project Greenlight. It was a series, I think there were four uh, seasons. Uh, in the last season, there was a young man who had made a horror film, and um, he, was, he won a contest. He got the chance to make his movie. Um, and they have a brief moment when he's on the lot uh, at, at a studio um, in prep for his, making his movie. He's going to make it, and he runs into Kevin Smith. Um, Kevin Smith is friends with uh, Ben Affleck, who was one of the producers. And Kevin Smith says to him, hey, you know, congratulations, you're going to make your movie. That's cool. Um, and the guy says something like, you know, I know, I don't know everything. And Kevin Smith says, you don't know anything. And he says it in a very friendly way and in a very loving way, but he means it and he's right. You, it takes a long time to learn this stuff. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you're bad and it doesn't mean what you do can't be a knockout. Kevin Smith's first script um, probably not his actual first script. The first movie he made made a big splash. However, he, even he knew he didn't know anything at that point. He he got lucky in that his first uh, messy instincts were commercially viable. That's a very lucky place to be. Um, and And honestly, so many people who are really talented don't get lucky. It's not, it's, not a, a, it's not a crime to not get lucky. Um, so the other thing I want to just say to you is if you are an older writer, does it have to be a script? Seriously, seriously think about this. We all think that we want to write movies because we watch movies. We want to write TV shows because we watch TV shows. And that's a natural thing. But... It's very, very hard to do. And even if you learn how to do that, a particularly obscure form of writing, it's incredibly hard to get anyone to read it or make it. Whereas if you write it in any other form, any prose form, a novel, an epic poem, anything you want, something that people read, then if you manage to work your way through writing it, which is a pretty cool accomplishment, you can give it to someone and, and the audience will have the experience. It will be the art completed. The art of screenwriting is never completed until somebody else makes your movie, which is not your part of the deal. So therefore, screenwriting is incomplete writing. And I urge you to consider some form of writing that you can complete because it just feels better and you learn more from it. 
And it doesn't have to be harder. Writing fiction can actually be easier because you already think in terms of writing that way. You already think in terms of just telling the story on the page. Um, you may say like, oh, we see this fancy shot. But the truth is, if you thought about it for a second, you could just say, the town is spread out beneath us. Uh, the roads go crossing. The people look like little bugs. Whatever it is, you don't have to put camera crap in there. Just take us on that journey in words. Does it have to be a script? The other thing about being an older writer is it's actually kind of harder because uh, you have an accumulation of, of rules in your head and judgment and and expectations that very often young people don't have. Young people often just have no idea how hard things are. And so they plunge in blithely and wonderfully and God bless them. Um, and that often gets them magical places. Older people, it's harder to plunge. It's harder to dive. And so therefore, uh, you know, it can be actually a little harder to start the arts when you are old, but you have more to say. You have a lot more experience, a lot more knowledge. You've just seen more stuff and read more stuff. So it's a balance. And once again, that balance leads towards a form that you can control and complete, not a script. Write a poem. Write a novel. Write a novel that's basically in screenplay form. Just take out the, the scene breaks and the dialogue format into dialogue. Okay. Um, and yes, uh, the, the pitch for DIY, as Mazzarini says, uh, it is absolutely good. Good for you, Maria. Um, hi, Anne. Good to see you. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, Natasha. I am, I am proud of all of you guys. This is great. Um, yes, I started writing when I was 10, 11 years old. Um, we all... We all are allowed. We all can do it. And everybody, <laughs> yes, Natasha and Maria are the fabulous 40s. Um, there are many, you know, there is a big audience for older people's vision. Um, yes, Orson Welles was only 26. Honestly, who cares? <laughs> if you are going to, to, to base your life plan on lottery winners, then you better be scratching really, really luckily because Orson Welles was extremely rare and extremely lucky. He had many, many opportunities that put him into the position where he could put it, make Citizen Kane. Okay, It's not like he just walked out of nowhere and made Citizen Kane. He had already been working in the business for a long time, just not in movies. He had been working in theater and radio. Um, you're welcome. Uh, uh, let me think about that. I'm gonna. I, I want to try and get, get through all my stuff here. Um, okay. <laughs> yes, I am sure it is very convoluted. Um, is a eighteen too young for being a screenwriter? Yeah, it's frankly a little. You've got you've got some stuff to learn, but that's okay. Don't stop. <laughs> Just don't expect to be hired right now. It's not impossible. The odds are you'll do better if you um, either write for four years or go to college and write. Um, it depends. Don't get into debt if you can help it. Um, but anyway, uh, the answer is most writers in Hollywood are in their 20s or 30s, not in their teens. Um, okay. Uh, yes. But but the answer, by the way, is it takes years. So it's great. If you start at 18 or 20, maybe by the time you're in your mid-20s, you'll catch a break. Um, partly, the way you catch a break is by doing a lot of work. That's how you get good enough, and that's how you get noticed, and that's how, should you catch a break, you know what you're doing, because the demands are very, very, very hard on professional writers. So don't kid yourself that you're going to learn on the job. You have to already be good when you start. Okay. Uh, a thousand pages is, is yeah, I guess. Uh, I'm trying to think, like a thousand pages is about ten scripts, nine scripts. Yes, that sounds cool. Uh, I would say... Do do how as many as you can. Um, all right. So let's let's talk a little bit more. The main thing I want to say to older writers is do what you can 
as who you are with what you have right now. Especially if you're an older writer, don't wait. Don't study for five years. Start writing now. Learn as you go. And honestly, choose the form most comfortable for you, not the one that is hardest. If you are really, really comfortable writing scripts, cool, write them. Frankly, you could always, you know, novelize them later or make them into a play. Who knows? I'm just telling you that screenwriting is the least, is the most bottlenecked form of, of writing in terms of getting out to an audience. And getting out to an audience is really important. It is better to get out to an audience of 30 or 50 people than to not get to any audience. Seriously. Everyone thinks, oh, yeah, that's not real. It is real. If you were a, a painter and you just you know did a show at a local gallery, how many people would see it? A hundred? It's fine. That's great. That's amazing. That is what you want to do. Um, okay. Um, cool. If you can get a manager, that is superb. You are on your way, Mr. Fiction. Um, good, good. I hope that the manager is giving you some of the advice I'm giving you, which is get good at your job because it sounds like you got the drive and the persistence and, uh, it, it sounds like you probably have a, bring in a lot of skills and talent already. Great. Uh, Get good at the job. Um, <laughs> I don't get lucky. Yay. Uh, <laughs> okay, Ed. Um, yes, if you're also, yeah, that's the other thing. If you're writing, or even just whatever you're writing is not what is currently being bought, and what's currently being bought is constantly shifting, by the way, um, you're out of luck. Uh, there was a certain period when if you wrote Westerns, nobody was going to buy them. Uh, then there was a period when if you wrote romantic comedies, nobody was going to buy them. There was a long period where if you were writing sci-fi fantasy, forget it. Um, so, you know, it, it is it is uh, important that you be talented. It is important that you be hardworking. And then you have to get lucky. Um, yes, very good point. The game industry really, really needs writers. <laughs> and that's a whole different kind of writing. Um Yes, and, and Maria definitely knows. Um, okay, so so let me just... Uh, yeah, God of War, there's, there's a lot of good games, uh, games with really fascinating uh, uh, near automata. There's some amazing games out there. Um, <laughs> and you and me both, I actually started to think about writing when I was, uh, yeah, sent to my room as a kid. Um, Okay. All right. Let me just, I'm just sort of skimming here. Uh, it's a lot more to do with life experience and introspect. Yes, but you'd be amazed how much experience anybody has. Even, even a 10 year old has an awful lot of life experience. It's a question of introspection. That is something that varies person to person. Um, but you can develop that. And for some people, um, actually writing is escape from introspection. Uh, there, there's no real rule. Um, okay, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here for a second and um, uh, road screens are you short. Yes, yeah, films of 48 hour film project. <laughs> That's hard. Uh, real fast writing. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> you're in India. Cool. The Indian. By the way, I should say this. Anything I am saying has to do with the American film industry. Um, I do not know how it works in India. I am not saying what I'm saying is universal. Um, Bruce here has been self-publishing novels for a dozen years. Good for you. Bruce, Bruce, I give you major cred. That is great. Um, Bruce is, is doing it because if you write a novel, you can self-publish it and you can, if you want, hawk it to bookstores one at a time or set up a website there's so many ways that you can get that handful of people to read it, and you never know. Somebody might like it, and it might get passed around. It is possible. But the main thing is, it's immensely satisfying. And that is why you should be doing art, for the pleasure of doing the art, finishing the art, and sharing the art with somebody. Okay. Um, I've never heard of Celeste, but I've, uh, that's cool. Um, okay. Okay. Guys, uh, I'm going to now leap to my next question because this is a 
biggie. It's a fascinating one, actually. Um, how do you deal with a crushing career disappointment or setback? And this, I'm going to read you this one from Joe. Um, Joe wrote, uh, I get a uh, quote, I get a short scene to 30% of what I'm happy with coming along great guns. An IT tech has to close the document and in the rush forgets to save changes. When I open it later, I realize I am back to square one. Frantic panic. Will I be able to stave off this debilitating anguish? I'll never get it as good as that. I wrote so well. How do writers overcome such a blow, such a setback as losing valuable work worked hard from? Okay, once again, this is where we go to my favorite thing. You already know the answer. <laughs> His next sentence is, Then I realize that writers write. You think up stuff. You create. If you did it once, you can do it again. Actually, the name of the game is doing it again and again for a myriad of reasons. So I chilled. But does losing a page or two for a real professional still hurt as much as it would for some of us who are, say, still subject to writer's block? Um, could you talk about that? How do you handle crushing disappointment that well-done work is lost? That would be valuable uh, encouragement. Okay, first of all, like I said, uh, and, and Joe got himself out of it. Um, but that is a horrible thing. I, I'm just talking about professional writers having a horrifying loss. The novelist Ralph Ellison, um, who wrote a book called Invisible Man, phenomenal novelist, um, he was working on his next novel, which was called uh, Juneteenth. It was a massive historical epic. He had been working on it for a long time. And this was back in the, the 60s, I believe. He had a fire in his house and it burned. And it was his only copy because it was the 60s and things were written on paper in those days. And it was devastating to Ralph Ellison. And uh, he did later rework it. He never finished that book. Um, he kept reworking it, kept trying to rebuild it. Um, from what I understand, and I'm, I'm not positive at this, but what I read was he actually went and bought a Xerox machine. <laughs> and whenever he wrote, at the end of the day, he would Xerox it, throw it in an envelope, and mail it to his lawyer or his agent or somebody, the publisher, so that there was a copy. <laughs> and, and I think that that is a really important thing for you to think about. Back up your work. Be, feel very, very lucky that we are not in the world of, of everything being only on paper. If you do work on paper, take a picture with your phone, scan it, do something. Make a copy of your work. Save it. Archive it. Make copies. This is really, really, really basic. Um, if you will notice when I am doing the step-by-step, uh, I always, if I'm going to work on a draft or an outline or something, I make a copy, I keep the old one as it was, and I work in the copy, and I name it for the date I made the copy. So then I always know which one was when and which one is the latest one. That's the one I'm working on. It's really simple to do on computers. Uh, most of you, my guess is, will be working on some form of digital technology. Just make a damn backup, <laughs> please. There is no reason that you should have to suffer this unless, like Joe, you let some IT guy come over because clearly he was working at, at the office and somebody came and, and uh, took his computer away. Um, but, you know, crashes happen. Blackouts happen. Things happen. So save. Make a copy. And when you make changes, when you make big changes, make a copy. Do you never know you might want that stuff? Okay. Um, uh, okay. All uh, right, 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 right. Uh, oh, yes, that's true. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, turn on autosave. Yes, if you have software that autosaves, cool. If not, just save it. As N says, yes, you should have some faith. Um, here's my basic approach to everything about the arts, and this goes for should I try and sell my work or what, you know, should I save my work or anything? Hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Back up your work. Prepare for what happens if it doesn't sell. Don't start something thinking, if I, this doesn't sell, I can't live. Because the odds are, uh, prepare for the worst. It's really, really, really important. Um, that is the first thing. The other thing is, you know, artists, artists have to be kind of delusional 
and savvy at the same time. It's a very tricky thing being an artist because in order to write something, you have to believe that someone out there is going to like it. Um, th that is somewhere in your head. Even if you're writing the most obscure personal thing in the world, there is some desire uh, most likely to connect with someone. Maybe it's just a, yourself at another point in your life. But somehow or other, we have this delusion that people give a damn about what we're writing. And that's a great thing. That's what makes art happen. On the other hand, you need to be pretty coldly calculating about what are the odds? What is it worth? If you are trying to be a professional in a particular business, have to learn about that, what that business needs and deal with the difference between what you like and what they like. So it's a constant balance between hoping for the best and planning for the worst. It's really, really important. So, uh, but in the particular case of, of actually losing something, not, not because somebody didn't like it, but like actually have your work taken away from you, um, the answer is, you know, you're going to do what, what you do as a person who, who has a feeling. Let yourself feel the pain, okay? Bad crap happens, and there is no point in not feeling it. Let yourself mourn, let yourself rage, let yourself heal in whatever way that takes. If, if you need to get right back to work, cool. If you need to take some time away, cool. Your feelings are legitimate, okay? Um, but in the end, I believe the answer is always make something new. Um, even if you complete your work and give it to someone and they make it, you're going to actually kind of feel somewhat let down. Trust me. Um, it is always a loss. Uh, the art, the making of art is the losing of art, the making of life. You know, if you have kids, you got to let them go. If you are, if you are writing something at a certain point, A, you finish it, but B, it becomes less than everything. And that's a healthy thing. It's important. And it's, while you're working on it for a little bits of time, your work has to be everything. It has to literally be the most important thing in the world for like weird bits of time while you're working. But then you have to step away and have a life. And then you have to go back to everything in the world. At some point, it's not everything in the world. It's just a thing to craft. It's just a thing, an object, a, a, a work. And that's an important stage of art letting it be just a thing. And then you have to recognize that it's not everything. And because you are an artist and not just an art maker, you don't just make one thing, you're going to keep making them. None of them will ever quite be everything. And that's okay. Just make something new. All right. Um, so, uh, once again, you already know the answer. Look to yourself. This is really, really important. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's, that's not a bad thing. Okay, uh, last one. I just want to get into um, very briefly, uh, how do royalties work? Um, uh, Kirby Light asked, how do royalties work for finished films? Um, and, um, and I thought this is worth just quickly mentioning, um, going into it a little bit. This one, like the question about... Um, how do you work for animation? To a certain extent, there's re this is researchable. But let me explain the basics. Um, there's a couple of different. There's four different ways that you get paid for professional writing: um, option, purchase, salary, or residuals. Okay, those are the four. I'm going to come back to that. Um, uh, none of them is what you think it is, <laughs> and none of them is royalties. By the way, royalties is for a play or a published work which you own the copyright of. And when you own the copyright of that thing, the um, the publisher or the, the people who produce the plays, they pay you what are called royalties. Don't know why. It's from centuries ago. Um, but what that is, is basically the right to use it for a while. Screenwriters give up the rights to their work when they sell it. They give up all copyright, all control, all power. Um, and so you do not get royalties, except your, weirdly, your foreign sales, you get royalties. You get like a separate check that says foreign royalties um, because the rules outside of America are different. Um, an option is somebody pays you a set amount of money contracted for a certain amount of time. For instance, a six-month option for $1,000, they have the right 
to be the exclusive producer of that project during that time. Essentially, when it says option, that means the option to buy it. So in the option is a plan for the purchase. They're, they're basically saying, I want to hold on uh, to the rights to this, but I don't want to buy it because I may not be able to get it made. So I'm going to ask you for the to pay you for the right to try and get it set up, to try and find somebody who will agree to pay the full price. The option, therefore, is sort of a rental. <laughs> they're renting. They're, they are saying, we are the exclusive owner of this property for this period of time. And if at the end of that time, we decide not to purchase it, you get it back. You have the rights back. We don't have any claim to it after that. But during that time, you can't give it to someone else. Um, so that is an option. Um, it's an option to buy, which means, be careful, sometimes the price of the purchase is in the option. In other words, they'll say, we're paying you $1,000 to hold it for six months. And if at the end of that six months, we decide we want to buy it, we will pay you $100,000. Um, that's the deal. If they decide at that point that they want to buy it, you cannot stop them. <laughs> Just so you know, it's, it's a weird story, but it can happen that during the course of that six months, somebody else could come along and say, I'll pay more. Doesn't matter. If they want it, you have given them the option to buy and they can buy it at that point. This is a very, very unlikely problem, but it can happen. It did happen to me once. There's pros and cons. Nothing you could do about it, but do be aware that that can happen. Um, the main thing is options can be for as little as a dollar. Um, depends on whether or not you're working with a Hollywood entity or a individual indie producer. Um, and there's nothing wrong with a $100 option or a $10 option, depending on the amount of trust between you and the person and the uh, other possibilities for what's going on. If you don't have a lot of other things going on, how does it really hurt to give this person the, the what that does is it empowers them to go out and take it around because they can't take a script around to try and get it made with their connections if they don't have the option because the people who they're showing it to will say, I don't want to talk to you if you don't have the option because what happens is in their experience, somebody comes and says, I've got this great script. I don't have the option, but if you want it, we can get it. They say, we want it. When the author hears that they want it, the price goes sky high and they can't get it and they get into an auction and horrible things happen. So they want to know you have the option. It's just important for the producer. It's a fair request. Um, if you do not know this producer, if this producer is not a professional, keep the time limit really short and keep the uh, option price something you're comfortable with, but don't expect them to pay a lot of money. It's just not reasonable. Um, uh, no, option is not always 10%. It is uh, not, it can be, it can be 10%. It can also, like I said, be $10. Um, yes, uh, you are not allowed to do anything with it. Uh, they own the rights, the copyright to that property. Um, so yes, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. all right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's testable actually. You can find that out. Uh, my guess is you're not. It's just things are going on. Anyway, so that's the first thing is the option. Oops, sorry about that. My mistake. Click the wrong thing. So let's talk about the types of pay again. So there's option. The purchase is the actual. They are paying you. It's a gigantic contract. It's full of incredible amounts of detail for stuff that you won't understand. Get a lawyer or an agent uh, to look at it. Really, really important. Um, but honestly, that's very unlikely to happen. Um, uh, but if they do, that usually the, that's a fairly big price. If they are a Hollywood-based studio, if they are a studio that works in the American industry, they are almost always part uh, signed to the Writers Guild, which means the Writers Guild, WGA.org, has a whole schedule of minimum prices. You can look that up, uh, WGA.org. But most writing 
is not that any of this, okay? Most writing is professional is actually salaried work for a corporation. You are actually just getting a weekly paycheck. You sign a contract for a certain amount of weeks or months um, in order to uh, work on a show. Or that if you're doing a rewrite, you are hired to do a set number of drafts in a certain amount of time. Whatever it is, you are going to be paid a salary as a work for hire. It's not you are an employee and the rights to the material, do not, what you write does not belong to you. Most writing work is salary. And it's straight, you know, you pay the taxes, the taxes come out of it, and they report it to the government, and there's all these rules about it. And I promise you, if it comes up that you are being hired to work on a salary for a company, they'll explain it. <laughs> Do what they say, <laughs> okay? <laughs> they are bigger than you. Uh, yeah, sure, you can sometimes negotiate when you start. But if you're, if you're asking this question, then just do what they say if they come to the, you with the salary, because it'll be fine. If they are a Writers Guild uh, signatory, you will be fine. Um, uh, okay, sorry, wait a second. We're still on. Then residuals. Okay, the thing that uh, the thing that that screenwriters have that is instead of royalties. The Writers Guild arranged for a thing called residuals, residual payments, payments after the project is produced. Those, uh, oh, by the way, uh, your salary, your purchase, your option, uh, your lawyers, your manager, your agent all take percentages out of that, usually 10, 5 to 10 percent, um, which can build up to 25 or more. Um, but residuals are after the piece is released to the public based on various formulas from the Writers Guild of America. It's all in the Writers Guild, what they call the MBA. MBA stands for, I don't, I don't know what it stands for, Minimum Business Arrangement. I can't, I can't remember what it is. Anyway, it's the, 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 the basic business contract of the Writers Guild with the studios. It's called the MBA. The main thing is residuals are every time your work gets shown on the internet or sold as a download or runs in the theater for a certain amount, there's a little tiny slice of that that goes to you. And every quarter, they send you a check for that amount. Famously, you will, if you have, like, if you've worked on a sitcom that was on 20 years ago, <laughs> you will get a check for 12 cents <laughs> because it played one time and your little tiny sliver is it. It's a sort of Hollywood thing for Hollywood writers. They like compare. I have seen somebody with a check for one cent. Uh, yes, I, my lowest, I think, was nine cents. Um, it happens. But that's the, the later. And, and these residuals can be hefty depending on whether it's uh, uh, what the original release was and how big it is. Uh, anyway, that's the deal on, on uh, pay, the types of pay. There's option, purchase, salary, residuals, all of these things you can find out on the Writers Guild of America website. Just do some digging around there. It is up to you as a writer who wants to be in on this to research it, to learn it. There's also tons of articles and interviews Tons of lawyers and agents have done interviews and articles where they have talked about how this works. Uh, I'm better at other things. But the thing you should know is, the main thing is you're not probably, if, if you get to the level where you're working at the Writers Guild level or the, the, the Hollywood level, there's rules and you'll play by them. And that's fine. The thing that you need to know is if you are in the indie world, if you are outside of the Writers Guild uh, covered companies, then, first of all, find a lawyer, producer, or agent who knows indie contracts, if at all possible, have them look at it. If not, at least go on the internet and read interviews with those people. <laughs> They've got whole, people have written whole books on the law of entertainment contracts and stuff, on, on what you should and shouldn't know. Um, Yes, you get residuals on the scripts you have sold. That's the only way you get residuals. If you have sold a script and it has been made, then you get residuals. If it didn't get made, no residuals. Um, but anything that you sold and got made for the Writers Guild, um, there's the, there, there usually are some kind of fruits. Um, no, you do not. But your picture is very American. <laughs> I just want to say. Um, anyway, um, if you're not an American, uh, 
um, uh, you're working in another business, research it. Learn about the business in the nation that you are in. That's your job. Um, but my main thing is, if you are um, not in there, be real about your reality, okay? And be real about the reality. I, I constantly hear people saying like, oh, I don't want to give an option to this producer because what if a studio comes along? It's like, no studio is coming along. Talk to someone, figure out if you can trust them, talk to people they have worked with and see if they have been cheated. Try as much as you can to get some sense of reality, okay? Not Hollywood reality, your reality. And the other part of that reality is if you are, if you are working in the indie world and some producer comes and says, here, here's $100 for your script. You know, if we sell it, you'll get more. Take it if you can afford it. I mean, unless somebody else is doing it, why not? What the heck? You know, after you've done 10 of them, maybe you don't want to do it anymore. You don't want to sell out for nothing. It's fine. When you're starting, just realize that, you know, honestly, you're not doing it for money. Okay. That's not what it's about. Um, outs you are in outsider art. You are making art outside of the profession. And that's great. It frees you up to take to, to do things for experience, to do things for opportunity. There were plenty of times I wrote scripts and I still, you know, one now that I am not, uh, you know, held by the the Writers Guild won't let you write for free. But um, but if you're not in the Writers Guild and some producer says, hey, you know, you want to work together on a project and I can't pay you, but you but this person has made movies before um, or, or knows people and it's something you actually want to do. First of all, you don't have the rights to it. Don't expect to control it. But it's a good experience. Try it. You know, it's not the end of the world. Uh, you can't be overly precious as a screenwriter. You just can't. Um, you got to try, you know, if you, if you wrote something and you love it, don't sell it for nothing if you don't trust or like the person who, who is offering it to you. But if somebody uh, earns your trust... Um, first of all, if they are, want to earn your trust, they will probably do something like an option, which has stuff that protects you, uh, and not an outright purchase. So just in general, try to be realistic about your reality and about the reality of the other people working. And don't base your reality on Hollywood reality. They're not the same. Hollywood reality is not reality. Okay, so the main important thing is it's not about money. You are not going to make that much money in the arts unless you get very, very lucky and, and then you get picked up by the business, at which point, I promise you, the business will take care of the rules. You are not going to make new rules. You'll just learn them as you go. People will explain them to you. If you get into the position where you're being hired to pay uh, for a salary by a writer's guild, thing, they'll explain it to you. They'll give you booklets with stuff. It's fine. <laughs> um so, oh my gosh, Mr. Fiction, uh, I, I hope you get some sleep. Um, yeah, see, Jeff, Jeff knows um, 500 bucks, you know, you have a good relationship and there's more work to come and you, and you, you know, it's cool. It's a good experience. You never know. That's how indie people work. They find reliable, honest people that they can work with who are like them outside of the business, doing the best they can, not trying to make a killing, just trying to get some work done. That's where you are. Um, <laughs> overly precious and overly precious and dyslexic. You're going to write slowly, but it's going to be worth it. I guarantee it. And I promise you, you are doing okay. Um, no, you, it's not necessary to join the WGA if you are in India, because it's of America, Writers Guild of America. Don't worry about it. Find out what's the deal in India and do that. Um, so listen, uh, I've gone over my hour, um, but oh no, wait, wait we are, I'm not going without this one. Okay, let's talk about Dialectics Junkies question, which was, how do you write with an initial inspiration that's intellectual rather than emotional or something sensory? Good question. The answer is probably not going to surprise you. Same deal. <laughs> um, whatever you whatever you start from, 
you build from there. If you start from an intellectual um, inspiration, for instance, you know, I want to talk about the difference between uh, Zen and monotheistic, you know, views of life. <laughs> okay, um, then cool. Think about how are you going to make that into a story. So let's let's talk Glenn. Let's talk Glenn's uh, videos. First of all, you are probably going to want to get to this. You are definitely going to want to watch. Oh damn! Use what you have. I don't have it. Use what you have. There's a. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Okay. Use what you have. Start with where you are. If where you have is a conflict between two philosophies, then somehow or other, you're probably going to have to get those into characters. They could be characters who are uncovering that. They could be characters who believe that and come into conflict. Somehow or other, you're going to probably want to get into um, a, a character-based narrative. Yes, you could have an intellectual inspiration that becomes an intellectual work. Um, I should talk about that some other time. It is possible to write a non-narrative movie. It is possible to write a movie of ideas. It is also going to be, uh, that's going to, you're going to have to find models for that. Uh, sounds like it's kind of veering into documentary, to tell you the truth. Um, but there's all sorts of ways to do it. The main thing that you want to, to do is decide what kind of project you want it to be. If it's a purely intellectual project, you're going to have to sort of invent that form based on models you have found that you like. Um, however, if you um, if you want to turn it, take your ideas, your intellectual ideas, and get them into a narrative, not even a conventional narrative, but any kind of narrative, then definitely you want to do use what you have, you want to do, um, let's see, how about, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just scribbling. Yeah, uh, process of questions, that will definitely help. Um, dramatic action is really important. Um, and character arcs. Oh, and also brainstorming, that would help too. So these are things that really, really will help when you take the intellectual beginning and use that as the basis, ask those questions. Well, who is going to be dealing with these questions? Maybe it's like a kid who is has a, a devil and an angel on, on either shoulder. You know, whatever the intellectual basis is, begin to think out how do those questions lead you to people doing things and saying things and wanting things? Uh, the intellectual and the emotional always come back and forth to each other. Whether or not you start with one or the other doesn't matter. You could start with the emotional and end up with the intellectual. You know, you could start with, I want to tell a story about somebody who's lost in the woods, and pre pretty soon you get to existentialist visions of life. Um, that's, that's the deal. Uh, the, I, I hope I got you, dialectics junkie. Um, I, I was talking about dialectical intellectuals because of your name, but the answer is um, use what you have. Use what you have. Do a process of questions. And I think you're probably going to end up with these six at some point. Um, and character arcs. That's the answer. I couldn't. I couldn't let it go this time. I had already. It's two weeks ago that he asked the question. I wanted to get it. Okay. I have not been able to actually read most of the chat, and so if somebody asked a question there, I truly apologize if I didn't see it. Please put it in an email. Okay. The way you do the emails is pretty simple. You just go to. Oh gosh, where is it? You know, writingforscreens.com. Gosh darn it, people! You clearly know this. Uh, there we go. The quest, the contact me button on writing for screens. <sighs> okay, great. Um, you guys are welcome. It has been a delight. Uh, have yourselves a fabulous weekend. Watch or do not watch the American Academy Awards as you will. Um, Spider-Man's not up, so already a little off. Uh, I did love Power of the Dog. Um, I loved a lot of the movies, actually. I'm, I, but, but, you know, uh, we'll see. We'll see. Lots of possibilities, lots of things going on. 
Uh, will we see? That is a great question. I believe the answer is no. So thank you for asking. Hold on. Let me check. No, no. My mom has an eye doctor appointment I got to go to. Um, I will see you Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. Um, you are entirely welcome. You are welcome. <laughs> thank you. I, I worked on that. Okay. Uh, I got to go. Uh, and so go write something.